Human beings naturally fear that which they don't understand. The fear is oftentimes misguided, but sometimes it's more than justified. What horrors might lie beyond what we understand, beyond human perception, around dark corners where our views are narrowed by shadows, finding ourselves in places that we weren't meant to be, or maybe even places we were meant to be but dearly wished we weren't. And even scarier than that, under the right circumstances, the familiar can be far more frightening than the unknown. The Oldest View is a miniseries currently comprised of three parts by the creator Kane Pixels. We follow our protagonist, Wyatt, who has found a mysterious underground staircase that leads to a mall. Of course, this is a horror series, and things are not what they seem, or maybe even worse, they are. In today's video, I'll explore the series and what I think it means. If you guys enjoy the video, I'll also do another on the way Kane created horror in the series, as well as the technical aspects such as the sound and world design. I'd recommend watching the series yourself because it is very good, if a little bit slow to start. I'll also preface the fact that this is actually my first time watching any of Kane's content. I've never really been interested in the back rooms, but this caught my interest. I was led to it by a video that probably inspired him to make it. This video featuring the actual abandoned mall and the giant, which is now filled with comments from people coming from Kane's video. Anyway, let's explore the creeping, familiar horror of the oldest view. Episode 1 is short and simple. Titled Renewal, we see a man wearing an older style of clothing exploring a forest, looking at the plants and foliage, and eventually sitting down to read. Then, after this, we see the creation of a cardboard face, as a distorted version of the song When the Swallows Homeward Fly, sung by Alan Thompson, plays. For now, we're going to leave this as it is, but we will come back to it. Keep everything in mind here, as it's all important. The second episode, titled Beneath the Earth, starts off interestingly. We see a sepia-toned sky, with what sounds like creaking, rolling wheels approaching. Then, we cut to a rather upbeat vlog by a young man named Wyatt, who has found a hole with a really, really long staircase in it in the middle of a park. He says it's on private property, so we don't really know where it is. Wyatt, of course, decides to descend the long staircase. As he's going down, he says that it smells of cut grass, and ominously says to himself that... I'm probably very calm, I'm starting to realize that this is a really stupid idea. But hey, my choice selection, right? Oh, Wyatt, if only you knew. After descending the nearly mile-long staircase, Wyatt finds himself at a wall and door. Both the door and wall are incredibly aged, almost disturbingly so. The room behind the door is also just as disturbingly decrepit as the door itself, with a rusty grate that leads into another area. This whole room just reeks of, don't come here. But Wyatt decides to crawl under the grate and see what's behind it anyway. And what does he find? Well, I'm not supposed to be here. A mall. Yes, he's in a storefront in a mall with one of those gates behind it, and he can hear music playing, and this is where the video ends. Viewers at this point had to wait a few months before part three came out. Part three is called The Rolling Giant. Hmm, I wonder why. This one begins rather terrifyingly in comparison to any of the other parts. Before cutting back to Wyatt again, rather joyously vlogging as he's going about his day, talking about how he left up trail cameras and no one showed up, and also the fact that a light in the tunnel down went out. But there isn't much important information here besides that. Oh, is that a red flower next to the tree there? Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. On the way down, Wyatt again mentions the smell of cut grass. It, still, it smells like, like the cut grass smell that I mentioned. It's um, like a cornfield kind of smell. Again, we see the same creepy room that he entered in previously. Wyatt, of course, enters the room and goes out of his way to crawl underneath the grate that allows him to enter the mall. 
Wyatt takes his time to open one of the metal shutters, which clangs loudly and causes him to rush back, scaring him. I'd say this is the last point he can turn back, but he doesn't. He decides to go back in and explore. This is literally like the, uh, uh, the backrooms uh, from TikTok. Backrooms mention! Wyatt points out that there is an AMC. It's a fucking AMC. Which, yeah, it's odd. I mean, this whole underground mall is odd, and honestly, you, you should probably get out of there. Wyatt, like us, is disturbed when he first finds the rolling giant. <laughs> he says that he doesn't like it, and right after that, the lights come on. I feel like this could possibly be connected, but who knows. This is when Wyatt decides that he needs to nope the fuck out of there. He does his best to stealthily scramble back to where he got in, only to find that it is crumbled in on itself, and that he is sadly trapped. Where? Man, you should have left earlier, honestly. After this horrific discovery, Wyatt is forced to continue exploring, looking for a way out or some hope. He happens upon a poster of... Wait a minute. That guy looks kind of familiar. Wyatt finds that all of the ways out of the mall are... Well, they're not exits, it's just stone walls. When Wyatt first ran into the rolling giant, he also noticed the octopus on the wall, which we're seeing again. Yeah, it's an octopus. I'm sure you all noticed that something is missing, though. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. It seems Wyatt realizes it's gone, too. And then, thunder is heard, and the lights begin to go out, and... And oh god, it's over there. It wasn't over there before, but it is now. I, I don't like that. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps. Oh, and it's gone. It's gone again. Man, that boy is schmoovin'. This is when things really begin to fall apart. In more ways than one, like literally as well. This is also the first time that Wyatt and me as a viewer notices that one of the art studios is now, well, overgrown with fauna and forest life. Then he hears a distant squeaking or creaking of what could possibly be, hmm, maybe wheels? And then... Oh, fuck. Oh, God. There it is. It's right there, and it wasn't there before, and that is fucking scary. Wyatt, of course, tells the hulking, rolling statue that he's just trying to leave, but man, I'm sorry to say, I don't think that that matters at this point. I'm leaving. I'm trying to leave. It begins toying with him, and eventually Wyatt catches on that this thing does not play by the rules. Hey. Hey. It's kind of a bad boy, if you will. Wyatt takes off running, but the thing gives chase, and he eventually ends up in the back rooms of the mall. But he can still hear it wheeling around and even beginning to break down the windows of the place that he's hidden. After narrowly escaping the wheeled fiend, Wyatt runs about and finds himself in the mall's offices. Wyatt gathers some information on a possible way out after combing through some documents and continues on, though there is more to this scene than meets the eye. More on that later, of course. Wyatt then leaves the office, and as he's about to re-enter the main area of the mall, he sees a poster to the left of the door, and hears life behind the door. Music, people walking and laughing, as if it's just a normal mall now. This, of course, is an illusion. As he steps out, the mall has deteriorated drastically. The sound of birds can be heard and other things we don't really know what, as well as what sounds like music from a funeral and someone giving a sermon in the background. What? 
As he tries to escape, the giant surprises him. He makes his way upstairs, begins to climb, only to find that the giant can actually go up the escalator. Oh dear god, what a skillful guy. After asking what it wants, the giant uses what seems to be psychic powers to flash images of dead men and horses to him, which of course frightens the hell out of him, and then afterwards the giant charges him. Wyatt manages to escape the giant, but not the mall itself. And then, we see the surface. Wyatt having fallen to his death, now mysteriously lies in the grass of the forest floor, face pointed at the head of the giant. Both Wyatt and the giant are now devoid of color, both black and white set against the greenery around them, bright and vibrant. So now that we've set the stage, let's discuss. There's been a lot of discussion online in comments and forums about what this whole series means, what the story is. There's a lot of hints throughout, but I think that there will always be some mystery left for us to discuss. From Kane saying in his Discord that we are living in part 4 to what the giant really wanted from Wyatt. So we'll start from the beginning. The man we see in the forest in part 1 is an actor who I believe is playing Julian Revachon. Julian Revachon was a French botanist who moved close to a settlement called La Reunion in what would later become Dallas, Texas. If you don't know what botany is, it's basically the study of plants and fauna in nature. Now, why Julian is black and white while everything else is so vibrantly colorful around him? Well, I believe it's because, in our modern time, he's very much dead. The reason part one is called Renewal is because Julian is dead, but the piece of art that represents Julian, made by artist Kevin Oprejean, is in a sense renewing him and giving him new life. Art can give life to dead things, dead thoughts, dead feelings. He is, in essence, bringing Julian back, though in a different form. It isn't Julian, but in essence, it is. It is a representation of him and his ideas, his memory unforgotten. I think this is all brought together by the song that plays during this moment, When the Swallows Homeward Fly, performed by Alan Thompson on YouTube. There are actually many different versions of this song, with varying lyrics. But all of those different versions, including the one in the video, explore similar themes. The song sings of grieving the passing of time, the pain of loss, represented by the passing of the seasons into a dark winter. The end of the song sings of the passing of grief, when one can once again feel joy. Considering the name of the video and what I think it means, I think my interpretation is pretty close. The beginning of the song representing the death of Julian Revachon and the ending of the song representing his renewal, the idea of art giving him life. Not to mention the heavy use of nature in the song to represent these ideas, as both the song and the oldest view as a series focus on life and death and the ever presence of nature itself while other things fade away. But of course these are all my theories and I'd love to hear your own in the comments down below. This moves us into part 2. This is mostly build-up, showing what would come for the viewers later to build tension and apprehension, but there are still some pretty important tidbits here. At the start, we hear the creaky movement of what sounds like wheels, foreshadowing our large and terrifying friend that we and Wyatt meet in part three. As Wyatt travels down the mile-long staircase, I find him pointing out the smell of cut grass as a sort of sign. I'm smelling like a... Uh... Cut grass, like when you uh, mow the lawn, smelling good after. That's the, uh, the chlorophyll, right? As this is a smell of stress from plants that are being cut or endangered in some way. Wyatt also saying, I shouldn't be here, is also pertinent. I don't think he should be there either. I think he's going into a place where someone living does not belong. But of course, Wyatt is a YouTuber, so that sweet clout calls to him. This video did go viral, so maybe it was worth it, but probably not considering what we know. The main thing that I want to focus on in part two are the stairs and this little area at the bottom of them. These stairs, as well as this room, gave me strong Silent Hill vibes, and I wasn't the only one. I think if we're speaking purely symbolically here, these stairs are in a sense the transition into another world, symbolically and literally in this case as Wyatt has to walk down them to get to the mall below. And this, this terrifying rotting room is like passing through a barrier or portal. I also think it's a warning. Wyatt has to go into this room and purposefully crawl 
through a rusty, deteriorating gate to get to the mall. I think this is a warning of what is to come. This is a warning of deterioration. This is a warning of death. These things are at odds with almost everything else here. The pristine nature of the mall itself and even the aged stairs, which sure, they aren't in the best condition, but they look nothing like this nasty, deteriorating, scary looking room. Why is this one room so deteriorated, so rusted, so dilapidated? I think it's to show that you shouldn't be here, that this is what is to come, that this is what this really is. This is a place that life does not belong. There is, of course, music playing when he enters the mall. Whether this is important or not, I don't know at this point. Maybe it's just to tantalize him, but music and sound design is very important with this series, as we see in part one and also part three. And, speaking of part three, of course, this is where everything comes together. There's a lot to cover, but I'll try to keep it nice and tight. A lot of people have pointed out that the giant has red flags on its back, and we also see red flags within the mall office that Wyatt goes into, as well as what looks to be something red next to the tree at the beginning of part three. I don't think it is a red flag, I think it's a red flower, and I honestly don't know if it means anything greatly important to the overall story. But red flags do pop up a few times throughout the videos, and red flags typically do mean danger or a warning of some sort, but I'm not so sure. Once in the mall, Wyatt begins exploring. He of course notices the giant in the dark as well as the fact that it did move. This is just the start of the giant's game. Horror has rules and this guy likes to break them. Wyatt seems to think it works on Weeping Angel logic at first, aka if you're not looking at it, it's not going to move, but of course we know it doesn't. Almost seems like it's playing a game with him, like it or the mall is playing a game with him as we get further into it, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. The lights come on, of course, after he says that he dislikes it, which I don't know if they're connected, but it does seem like perfect timing. You say you dislike this thing, which is a living entity of some sort, and then the lights come on and scare the shit out of you. I think this is the point where he kind of transitions into the actual otherworldly nature of this place. As the lights come on, the mall takes on life, and the exit that he went in through, the portal, as I said earlier, is now closed. He is here. There is no getting out. I do think it's interesting that the room, the dilapidated room, is still there. It's just the stairs that are gone. This is followed by him finding one of the art studios that is now filled with plant life rocks, soil, and forestry, as if it's being overtaken by the forest above. This is just another sign of what is to come. After his first real encounter with the giant up close, Wyatt ends up in what looks to be a corporate office after a chase. The first thing Wyatt sees in this office are some type of plans for what looks to be a park or some type of complex to replace the mall that we are seeing. If you didn't know, this whole place is based off of what was once a real world location called the Valley View Mall, which was recently demolished in 2023. The plans in question show that they're going to replace it with some type of park, forestry, maybe even some type of complex. In real life, where the Valley View Mall once was, there seem to be plans to turn the area into a city within a city, featuring parks, shopping, homes, etc. How trendy. Wyatt also pours over a document that has reference numbers for further documents. These numbers may seem trivial at first, but for the overall plot point of the series, they're actually quite important. The first number is 1855-1857. When translated into the standard year-to-year -year history format, that would be 1855 to 1857. These two years were the time span of the short-lived La Reunion socialist colony in Texas that Julian Revachon went to when he came to America. The next set of numbers is 1973-2023. This should be pretty obvious, but it's 1973 to 2023. This was the opening year of the Valley View Mall, followed by the current year, which is when it was demolished after having been closed for a number of years and falling into decay and disrepair and even a fire. And last but not least is 1837-1905, the birth and death years of Julian Revershawn. After finding a map which just luckily marks where one of the exits to the mall is, how convenient, Wyatt goes to leave. He tries to rationalize everything he's seen, that it's all a mistake. It might be a mistake that he's there, but it might not. What I do know is that the statue definitely isn't a security system like he thinks, but that isn't really important. What is, is this. 
This poster and what Wyatt hears behind the door when he approaches it. Behind the door we hear what sounds like the mall when it was flourishing. People talking, music, laughing, walking, shopping. Or maybe just what could be people filing in for a funeral. The poster to the left says plainly, Do you accept this impermanence? And as Wyatt steps through the door, the sound of people fades away. The mall is a dilapidated wreck of its former self, much to Wyatt's dismay. The sounds of people are gone, and all that's left is what sounds like a piano or organ playing, music that would be fitting for a funeral. We then begin to hear someone speaking, almost in the tone of a preacher, giving a sermon, or more than likely, a eulogy. For the mall? For Wyatt? I guess we'll find out. Wyatt despondently runs through and is surprised by the giant who has been waiting for him. We see a flash of the other giants from the parade as Wyatt runs up the escalator. This is where our final confrontation with the giant happens. This scene has a lot going on, and I'm going to try to break it down as best I can. The giant comes up the escalator, which is something we didn't know that he could do before. Behind him, a wall panel falls, revealing an opening into darkness. Wyatt asks the giant what it wants, and it seems to flash a vision of, well, plainly death to him. Whose death? Is that important? I don't know. People are lying face down along with dead horses for only a moment, and then it disappears, and the giant storms towards Wyatt, or rolls towards him aggressively. The giant crashes into where Wyatt once was, and it begins to cause them all to crumble even faster. And as Wyatt does his best to scurry along towards the exit, he looks back and sees that those dead things that were flashed to him are now there, a permanent fixture in the mall. The giant rolls away and disappears, leaving only its stand, and as Wyatt tries to crawl out through this oddly placed exit, the pillar that he is using to stand on falls from underneath him and, well, leads to his death. In the final scene, as I said in the story above, Wyatt is black and white. He is black and white because he is dead from the fall that he suffered. Across from him, the head of the giant, also black and white as well, is staring lifelessly back at him. So, what is the oldest view about? What does the title mean? To me it seems pretty simple, but I could be wrong, of course. My theory is that the oldest view is about death. It's about time. It's about the inevitable march and the fact that things fade away, people die, places crumble. There's so much allusion to it throughout this series. The idea of birth and renewal, of this creation of art, of the giant, bringing life through art bringing the memory of Julian Revachon back to life. Wyatt's death, the color drained from him as well as it was Julian, who had long since passed even though what we saw of him was a living representation through acting. The giant as well seemingly loses its life. There are of course supernatural elements. Why was the mall there? Why did it change so quickly? That's harder to understand. It is horror, of course, some things we aren't meant to understand, that's where fear comes from. It could also all just be representations of life and decay. It's hard for me to tell the giant's motivations as a monster. Did it actually want to help Wyatt? When it comes up the escalator and the wall panel behind it falls, a part of me wanted to think that it was trying to show him a way out. Or maybe this is a representation of just more decay around it. It's certainly hard to feel like it has good intentions considering the way it stalked him through the whole mall so calculatedly. Almost like a cat playing with a mouse that it actually plans to kill. But in the end, it isn't the giant that kills Wyatt, even though it might have had the ability to do so with how hard it crashed into that wall there. It's the mall, or really his own attempt to escape it. To escape decay, to escape time, to escape death. The mall itself was a real place. The Valley View Mall in Texas, as I mentioned, which was demolished earlier this year. This is a shade of a real place, deep underground, most definitely not a natural occurrence. It seems Wyatt was unfortunate enough to happen upon some warp in reality, some type of time capsule of decay. 
If Wyatt hadn't come to find it, would the mall have just stayed there forever frozen in a form of stasis, if not for a human to come and find it, and view it, and give it life? It is humanity, after all, that makes places like malls a place that is alive. A building is just a building, an empty place, with no one there to enjoy it. This plays back to the color contrast we see, the bright green living forest against the long deceased Julian and the recently deceased Wyatt. Nature exists without us. The mall decays and returns to nature without us. It takes on a different life in its death. What Wyatt seemed to have experienced was an expedient timeline of the life and death of this mall, from its opening all the way until its final days, as it was overtaken by time. The statue of Julian, though, is now black and white as well at the end. Why is that? Well, art without someone to appreciate it is nothing, really. It's an expression, an expression without someone to enjoy it. Everyone knows that piece of modern art that's just a banana taped to a wall, but that means nothing if it was always like that or there was no one around to see it. It would just be a banana taped to a wall, a symbol representing nothing. But a person taped it there, which gave it meaning, it gave it intent. Kevin Obrejan created the giant. He gave it life as a symbol to represent the life of Julian Revachon, as a representation of who Julian Revachon was in celebration of him, the ideas that he had, the thoughts and feelings, the person that he was. Now that Wyatt is gone, no longer able to see the giant alive as it was in the mall, it no longer has any meaning. Of course, this is all theorization. These are all just my thoughts. I could be completely wrong, but who knows? Kevin said that we're living in part four. I don't know whether that means that there will be an actual part four or not, but it makes sense. If the oldest view is death, if the oldest view is time, and the inevitable march of everything to dust, every day we do live it. We live in a world now that exists after the video came out. It has been changed by it. And, like the giant, like Julian, it is an event in history that will one day fade and pass along just as all of us will. It's as beautiful as it is sad. That art, it really is just like a spooky alternate dimension mall full of a monster statue. Like, what was up with that screaming at the beginning of part 3? That's one of the few things that sits with me the most, the things that I find hard to explain even for myself. There is so much depth to this, so much that it could mean. This is all just my theories, of course, my theories and thoughts, and I hope you enjoyed exploring this series with me. I really do think that a lot of this is just a representation of time and the inevitable march of death, everything that we will be and won't be. That is the oldest view, it is the thing that, as humans, we have experienced since the beginning of time, existence and the lack thereof. To get more into the theorization of the actual story of it, what Wyatt probably happened upon was like the back rooms in a sense, a break in reality, a place that is gone and should not be, perfectly recreated anywhere else, but it was there. It was there and Wyatt saw it. It went from being a pristine mall to a decayed husk of its former self, complete with a funeral procession of giants to see it out, and sadly, one last victim. I say victim because, well, not necessarily that the mall was trying to kill Wyatt, but Wyatt was trying to escape something that is inevitable, decay, loss, something that at some point we're all going to have to deal with. Now of course, there could be more to it, and I actually do look forward to seeing more videos on this series, and more videos by Kane, and just more. This, this was so good. I had so much fun with this, and it's why I wanted to make a video on it. Besides the fact that it's spooky season, the oldest view is such a well-crafted piece of horror that has symbolism, it has tension, it has world-building and sound, and I am very interested to see more of what he's going to make in the future. If more of it is like this, then count me in on it. I am so excited to be scared by Kane Pixels. Anyway, I'm Ghosts on Holiday. Again, I hope you enjoyed exploring this with me. I hope you liked the video. And, uh, remember, you know, pumpkins are actually flying out of your ass.